Time to begin this evening. Take out a song book and turn to 521. 521. And after one song, uh, stand, uh, stand for prayer and Brother Jeff will lead us. On the cross of Shagoo, oh my Lord, your living hand is lost. Made to make me honest, but this work, the glory of His cross. Burn as it's grown, as it's grown, as it's grown, Present number will be three hundred ninety nine three nine nine.
Anyone needs an outline? We have two or three left, I think. We're on lesson number 12. And perhaps this one, more than any we've discussed so far in the article, gives us opportunity to say things about uh, the emphasis placed upon that which is chimney corner scripture rather than the scriptures themselves, which is why we want to deal with the scriptures at the end uh, of the article. But we, I talk in this particular lesson about uh, things that just, as we said before, sound like they belong there, and as I said, but aren't really scriptural. And so there's more of those here in this than perhaps uh, we've had in the past. Uh, we started in the upper left-hand corner of the outline you have. There has been now with this writing a dozen articles contributing to the theme of chimney corner scripture. As we always introduce the subject, it is predicated on phrases or sayings that have been uttered for years. In olden times, people conveyed, uh, conversed with each other, often while sitting around the fireplace, stove, or wherever the chimney might be. Some of these sayings originated from those conversations. Many of them have a scriptural or biblical foundation. Others just more or less caught on because of their whimsical or proverbial sounding words. Be that as it may, we look at a chimney corner scripture this week that I haven't heard for years, but perhaps some of you older folks will remember. Whip the devil around the stone. It sounds like it came from the Brown County Ken Hubbard, uh, as far as, as A. Martin Lodge is concerned. Uh, his uh, version of the Bible is what that uh, maybe sounds closer to. And a lot of people use sayings that, as we said, uh, sound like maybe they came from the Bible. And Ken Hubbard is known for that, uh, if you've ever read any of his works uh, from Brown, Brown County. Uh, but there are two schools of thought as far as it's with the devil around the stump is concerned. Uh, one is that it's probably that it came from an old Virginia tale. Its meaning was a simple one, that is, to evade responsibility. That's going to be the theme we're looking at in the scriptures this evening. So, uh, avoiding or evading responsibility. If a person did not want to do something, it was said of him, he is whipping the devil around the stump. The second possible origin is that it might be based on Matthew 4, 1 through 10, as Jesus was on the mountain being tempted by the devil. Notice at verse 10, the Messiah says, Get thee hence, Satan. And so from that statement, uh, some feel that this is where it came from. Uh, if it was inaugurated from possibility number one, it certainly fits the attitude of a lot of people today. Many do, want, many do not want to accept responsibility. We seemingly live in a society that does not want to do much of anything, and if they do something, they do not want the responsibility for it. Oh, they might take the credit but they don't want to meet the obligation. If it was inaugurated from possibility number two, it certainly fits the attitude that the Christian should have, get behind me, Satan. The thought of whipping the devil around the stump portrays an effort that the child of God would relish. Let's describe the scene from a scriptural view. The Apostle James wrote, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
Can't you just see Satan being chased around a stump by you? If it wasn't so serious, it would be a cartoon to behold. Notice the first the need to submit to God. When one does that, he or she can whip Satan all day long and feel good about it, for he or she is submitting to God. So again, tonight we want to talk about responsibility, accountability, and procrastination, and basing it on some of these, uh, on this one particular phrase, uh, whipping the devil around the stump. So uh, before we get into that, is there anything anybody wants to add to maybe another saying or cliche or comment on this one? Has ever, anybody ever heard of that before? That phrase? Gary has, and uh, you have it. You guys need to get together. Go ahead, Marvel. It's a family thing. <laughs> I'm just wondering, though, if uh, maybe some of that might have been taken from uh, Joe, too. I mean, you know, maybe it's possible. Sure. Because that, you know, the whole book of that is about. The devil being so hard on you, and he basically overcomes it. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the things I was thinking about. Well, <clears throat> so, is nobody familiar with this prayer? No? Well, I heard it when I was a kid, but uh, it's been a long time since I've been a kid. <coughs> so, even if you're not familiar with the phrase, you, you all understand what it's saying, what it means. That's. That's what we're looking for. Basically, we get the best of the other one in the water. Right. Okay, well, we'll uh, take a look at this with regard to uh, some things. Um, as far as the scriptures are concerned, some ideas I had. Uh, we'll take this first point. There's a, a second chart after this, so hopefully we'll have time to get through it all. But uh, if you have your own notes or comments that you want to make, as I said, feel free to comment at any time. This is just kind of a little outline that I had with regard to, shall I say, not an outline, but bullet points uh, that should help us to focus on uh, these three things of procrastination and responsibility and accountability. Uh, the first one we look at is in Proverbs 6, at verse 2, 4, and 6 through 8. And verse 2 says, You have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. Verse 4 says, Don't put it off, do it now. Don't rest until you do. And then verses 6 through 8, Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. Now that, needless to say, is from a more modern translation of the King James and the American Standard of One. Um, but, but anyway, the idea is conveyed to us uh, with regard to uh, the wisdom of Solomon here in Proverbs. Comments on verse 2, for example. Let's just take that one. Uh, this version says, You've been trapped by what you said. It's snared by the words of your mouth. How does that shirk responsibility or obligation or procrastination? Do that. Mouth ever gets you in trouble? Pardon? The tongue is a little member. Yes, James, James 3 says that the tongue is a little member. Yes, it, it generates a great fire, kindles a great fire. More thoughts? Lots of times we uh, need to be encouraged to get it done, procrastinate, and that's what uh, we, what he says ensnared by the words of your mouth is that we say we're going to do something and then we don't do it. We keep putting it off. Well, didn't you promise me that you were going to do this? Well, yeah. Well, when are you going to get it done? You see, that's, that's what we're looking at here, is shirking the responsibility that we have. Okay? When the... Uh... Israelites returned from Babylon and they were supposed to build a temple and rebuild in Jerusalem several times. Uh, you know, well, they were hindered by the local people that 
several times, and I said, why isn't this done? It's been so many years. Why isn't the wall finished? Why is it taking a while? Isn't that a Nehemiah? Uh, that's, that's totally right. Um, Nehemiah brings the, the remnant back, and uh, they're supposed to be building, and it keeps they keep putting it off, and people are saying, I mean, the local citizens were hindering them, but the Hebrews were saying, uh, you know, why, why isn't this done? And they, they should have been doing it. Another one just comes to mind, I'm not sure I, put, I don't see it up here anywhere, but uh, it comes to mind, mind is, uh, is it Haggai, where it says in the first chapter that you have uh, you have time to panel your own houses, but you don't have time to take care of the house of God. You ever started on a project around a house, and then you got it done immediately, right? <laughs> no, you procrastinate. You don't get it done. And sometimes you promise yourself or promise somebody, somebody else. Uh, you get trapped by what you say. So we need to be cautious and careful in what we set out to do, making sure that as the book of Numbers also, and we may talk about this a little bit, uh, maybe on the next page, but uh, where he says uh, not to be hasty in vowing about making a promise. People do that all the time. They say, oh, I, I promise you, I, I guarantee you, this is the way it is. What do you find out? That's not the way it was at all. But their mouth gets them into trouble. That's, they don't meet uh, the responsibility. They just uh, think they know. And I know a lot of people like that. They think they know everything. But come find out they don't know a whole lot more than I know. And that's not saying very much. So Solomon is wise here in his uh, treatise of 6 and verse 2. And then adding the fourth verse, don't put it off. Do it now. Don't rest until you do. That's what we have a tendency to do also. I said, well, we, we get started on this project, or we have this goal in mind, and then we become discouraged for whatever reason, or we decide, well, it's, I'm tired, I need to rest. And that, that does happen. We're not, I'm taking a thing away from the idea of resting. We all get tired, but we don't, sometimes people use uh, that as an excuse for not getting something done. I'm always amazed, especially young people, people come around and, and uh, ask them how they, how they had a good week or they had a good day. Oh, I'm just so tired. You couldn't possibly be tired. You're 14 years old. <laughs> you know? I mean, let's look at this realistically. Uh, as time goes on and we have a lot of wear and tear on our bodies, then we do get tired. And I understand. I, uh, you know, the sports, the athletics... And kids just put their heart into playing as hard as they can, whatever sport it is. And they wear themselves out. They do get tired. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody who just downright lazy and says, and especially is kind of irritating for a young person, that uh, I know they can't possibly be tired. Unless they got some physical problem. Any thoughts about these two verses that we looked at? As we read in the, what's the lesson from the ants, verses six through eight? I like I picked this version because it says, "Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones." <laughs> Pretty modern language. <laughs> the ants are what? Industrious. They're workers. You ever watch ants in a hill in the cracks of the sidewalk? You ever see those big ants carrying logs on their back? <laughs> I mean, it's what it looks like, you know, they're not really lungs, but the, for the size and weight, that's, you know, they're doing a lot and they're preparing. Uh, and that's what we need to do. I, how many times have you said, well, it's, it's August. I know we might need wood for the winter, but it's August. I got plenty of time. And lo and behold, about January, you say, oh, I didn't get any wood cut. I mean, that happens. But that, that's the type of thing we're talking about, just, just because maybe too busy with other things we have a problem with priorities 
And there's sometimes that, and I mentioned this also, sometimes we do make a promise and we're without thinking it through, it just kind of off the cuff, spur of the moment, whatever cliche you want to use. And we didn't really intend to make a false promise. So that's why Moses says in the book of Numbers to be sure that you don't recklessly vow a vow. When you do tell somebody that I'll guarantee you this is what it is, you better be sure that you can back that up. And with getting any project done, if you say, I'm going to do this. How many of you can remember back to 4-H days or some county fair project? We just went through this the last couple of weeks. And you remember what, what the problem was at home? You got that project done? Well, no, that's... And lo and behold, they're due tomorrow. Well, I got my name on the record book. That's about as far as I've gotten. You see, we, we have these problems with our everyday lives. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't get rid of those problems. They don't mature. They don't grow. They, they don't meet their responsibility. There, there is a time. And here's another series of verses in Ecclesiastes 11, the last two verses. Uh, now, let me just read them. Refer to it. Let me just turn over there and read the. Uh, we all remember chapter twelve and verse one and two about remember now thy creator and based thy youth. But just before that, he says in Ecclesiastes eleven verse nine, rejoice, O young man, in your youth. When you're young, it's time to have a good time, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. In other words, have a good time while you're young. But know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. That is, there's coming a time when it won't be play time anymore. You'll be accountable. You'll be responsible. You'll have to meet certain obligations. Therefore, verse 10, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. It's wonderful that kids have the opportunity to play and they don't have to meet the bills. But there's a time when they grow up and they mature that it's like Paul said concerning the spiritual gifts. When I was a child, I spoke in childlike ways. But when I became old, I put away childish things. That's the principle. So back to the Ecclesiastes 11, 9, 10, on into chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now, dear Creator, in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near, when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Then he really hits his heart as old people because in verse 3, he starts talking, well, in verse 2, actually, he starts talking about eye problems, and hearing problems, and, and physical problems, and all kinds of ailments that we have. You know? The real issue is, and I've, I've said this several times over the years, but the difference is between non-responsibility and irresponsibility. Never are we to be irresponsible. Solomon is not saying even in our youth can you be irresponsible. You have to learn to be accountable. But there is a time in your youth when you are non-responsible. You don't have to pay the bills. You don't have to put the roof over the families in. You don't have to put food on the table or clothes on their back. It's a time of joy. And, and I see this such a tragedy in a lot of families where they want the kids to grow up so fast that they don't let them, they don't allow them to really enjoy being kids. And I've talked to a lot of people over the years that have fallen into that situation as well. That they, they couldn't enjoy being a child because their parents, for whatever reason or excuse, uh, they had to grow up pretty quick. And so that's always, as I said, there, there's, Solomon is not teaching irresponsibility. He's teaching non-responsibility. And do all this remembering also God as your creator because there's a time coming when you won't see so well and you won't hear so well and your teeth are gone and all those things he lists there in the rest of the chapter. So just from this little bit in Proverbs 6, uh, verses 6 through 8, we learned a great lesson, several Here. great lessons from Saul. Yes. Oh, I, I thought you were going on or something. No. Wait a minute, but that. Verse 7 and 8, that, that is a really, really important thing to think about to me. Uh, you know, the ant, one of the smallest things that there is on the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, and yet in a fence, with nobody to guide, no ruler, no nothing, they do whatever they have to do. They have a cake bill. Of course, you know, we know God put that down. But to me, there's a lesson there for us to have ourselves trained as best you can and have the attitude, but mostly it's the attitude. Uh, you can just step up, step up. You know, if there's nobody there to help you or guide you, be ready to do that. You know, and that can go spiritual or physical. Sure. Well, we often, along those lines, we oftentimes talk about the age of accountability. When should a boy or girl be baptized? Twelve. <laughs> that's just you know, it can be 12, it might be 10 it might be 16, I, you know, somewhere along in there, when they reach the age of accountability, they're responsible they're learning responsibility and for most kids it is long in there somewhere you can't just say it's a different age because people mature differently there are some people who are great, uh, a lot older and still haven't grown up and matured so it's, it's a relative uh, thing that we, we can learn uh, from uh, from the ants and from uh, other things in nature. What well, one other passage I want to mention here on this? Do it now before we go ahead. And that's Ecclesiastes eleven three and four. When clouds are heavy, the rains come down. Whether a tree falls north or south, it stays where it falls. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. As I say, your version may read differently than that, but the message is still the same. And I especially relate to the farmer aspect of it because if you waited to, until a perfect day, you would never cut hay. Well, there's a 30% chance of rain. Well, at what time, at what percentage do you make a decision? Ours was always 40%. If it's much past 40, maybe you shouldn't cut hay. But anything 40 or less, you go ahead and cut that, that's just an arbitrary figure. But the message is what Solomon is saying here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And it says, think about the, the tree where it falls. Unless somebody comes over and cuts it up for you and hauls it off, it's, it's going to lay right where it fell. Because uh, it doesn't have the ability to get up and walk off. And so we see some things from nature here that certainly are, are true. Clouds are heavy. You look at the sky and you say, well, it's sure getting dark. Those are pretty heavy clouds. It's going to rain. And several passages talk about how we can tell the weather and what some of the signs. But anyway, the farmer who waits for the perfect weather and never plants is a procrastinator and they'll never, they'll never plant and they'll never harvest subsequently. All right, I've talked about this a little bit already, laziness, but we go to Proverbs 13 at verse 4. Uh, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. What's a sluggard? Do nothing. Yeah. Lazy. You ever see a, a slug crawling up the side of your house? That's the, that's the short version of a sluggard. Leaves that little slimy trail behind it, little on the sidewalk. They, they move so fast you can hardly catch it. Right? No! Even I can catch it. I can't bend over and get them. But, <laughs> but they're, they're lazy. They're slow. And so this is the thing that Solomon talks about with regard to the sluggard uh, craves and gets nothing. He wants things but he gets nothing because he's not going to work for it. Moves too slow. Uh, in verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 24, he said, The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. What's a sloth? You know what a slug is? You know what a sloth is? Slow mover too. It's a slow mover too, isn't it? How many hours a day does a sloth sleep? Say that three times real fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking it's, it's like 18, 20, maybe 21 hours a day. I can't remember the exact figure, but some phenomenal number like that. They just sleep. Solomon uses that illustration about laziness. He talks about the, well, we'll get to it here in just a moment. Uh, but we're seeing a, a pattern forming here. Proverbs 20, verse 4, a lazy person does not plow in the fall. He looks for something in the harvest but finds nothing. A lazy person 
verse uh, ten, uh, Proverbs 10 and verse 4. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. And so there is a positive side to being industrious. In Proverbs 26, 14, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. That's when I started the mission a while ago. And I said we'll get to it here in just a minute. And I always am fascinated with this picture. Uh, I've laid in bed sometimes with feet aching all over and feeling so bad that I just didn't feel like turning over. I mean, you, you get those aches and pains every once in a while. Maybe you've strained yourself or you're out of shape or whatever it might be. But you see what an effort it is when you're feeling bad, when your muscles are tired or sore. Well, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. It's just you're not going anywhere. You have to, the, the hinge is there to hold the door, uh, and you have to put forth some effort to swing the door open because the hinge isn't going to do it itself. And so there has to be a force of some sort. Otherwise, your hinge just does a lot. <clears throat> just stays there, does nothing. The door stays there, does nothing. So just because you got a door doesn't mean that it's useful. You have to put some effort into either opening it or closing it. We, we understand the simplicity of these things of which Psalm is speaking. And talking about laziness, when you don't have the <coughs> word I'm looking for, the, the energy and motivation to do something, and you fall into this lazy category. This is who Solomon, Solomon in Proverbs is talking about. Any thoughts on I'm doing all the talking this evening, so I pause there once in a while let you so Jeffy and Ivan. You know, first 24 here the kind of chuckle when I read that the, the Solomon says here, you know, the hand of the diligent will rule. You know, if you're mentally strong and you're using that, at least I'm, I'm assuming that's what yeah. But the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Now that that's gotta be mental lazy. Because most situations I've been around, you probably have too. If the first is a hard worker and you got a lazy guy over here, they'll take a guy who works hard working like a hard deal, which yeah. is another shit to correct that. <laughs> but you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, sure. Kind of contrast with us. Yeah, you, you walk up to that person and say, Where's your head? You just don't think it. I was at a, a job site today and tools were laying around in the mud. And another person said, well, that's the way he, he works. When he's done, he just drops the tools and leaves them there. And then all this rain, you find them in the mud. And just <laughs> no responsibility, uh, no accountability. And that's the way some people treat their tools. It's the way they treat their Bibles. The Bible is a tool. It's a spiritual tool to, to help us to build a spiritual house. Some people never crack the Bible. Some people don't use it as a foundation. I mean, this can just go on and on with all kinds of metaphors and symbolism. Boils down to time management. And we've talked about this on numerous occasions from Ephesians 5. Look carefully in how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. I think King James says uh, circumspect. Uh, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So we need to use our time wisely. And we squander time, we waste time, we don't use it wisely. And, and again, back to our first point this evening, if we don't do it now, chances are it's not going to get done. We procrastinate, we get lazy, and rather than managing our time, we just abuse time. Other than our souls, I really think time is one of the most precious, if not the most precious commodity we have. One of the greatest assets we have is time. And as I said, our, our soul is the most important thing, but as far as just as life is concerned, wise use of our hours and minutes and seconds uh, shows whether or not we're industrious, whether or not we want to be successful, and use our time wisely. Colossians, Paul said in 4 and verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. When people see you, you know the old cliche is your reputation has preceded you. And when they see you, they what do they think about you? Well, every time I've seen her, she's just wasting her time. Now that may be a judgmental thing that you ought not to do. 
On the other hand, it may be the conclusion that you've drawn because of the analysis in her action or lack of that action. They are wasting their... How many times have you heard somebody say, or you said yourself, they're just wasting their life. They get involved in whatever it might be that is pulling them down the tubes and causing all kinds of harm. And we, we stand back and we say, well, they're just wasting their lives. A lot of people like it. A lot of young people like it. I looked at obituaries about every day in the newspaper, and there were several young people in their 20s, and some of them have some very caustic remarks about how they wanted to die with the beer in their hand, uh, you know, this, that sort of thing. That was about a month ago, somebody, their obituary said that. And various people like that, and a lot of people die of drug overdose, and those things that, that do happen. Uh, recklessness, carelessness, and uh, you know, accidents happen, and tragedies befall everyone. But a lot of this could be avoided if we would use our time wisely. Time is an element in how you get as far as transportation is concerned from point A to point B. And if you speed from point A to point B, not using your time or your common sense or your wisdom, then you could suffer the consequences. Because there may be a bridge button that you will not miss and hit. There may be an obstacle in the road that you didn't see or going so fast you can't stop for it. Any, any number of things like this involve our time. And so we, we need as much as we can to use our time wisely. Jeff? Um, I think, in my opinion, obviously, this, this issue's been around forever as we're talking about it. Sure. In the Old Testament and everything else. But I think our society certainly doesn't help matters any in that there's no black and white, there's no delineation between anything. Even like the making or allowing our kids to grow up too fast. A consequence, in my mind, of that is that childishness then follows them in the adulthood because they don't see the difference. There wasn't a line between childhood and adulthood. So the adulthood crept into the childish part, and then likewise, the childish part creeps into the adulthood, and then you're not a good adult. And then, you know, it's, you know even the husband and wife, there's hardly any delineation between those two. So not having very specific roles, you end up not being particularly good at anything, because, you know, you don't, you don't know what your role is. One of the things we've said for years is we're not doing our kids any favors by not giving them any rules. You know, kids or people in general like rules. You know, they, they don't want to have to think all the time, you know, where is where's this taking me? You know, if you have very specific rules, you have very specific guidelines, and we're getting worse and worse at that. Well said. True. Tracy? Um. Kind of thing about time management. Um, I'm kind of thinking about it in a different way. Um, if you spend all your time being negative or holding grudges against people, uh, that can be just as bad sure. as anything else. And when uh, you read in here in Ephesians, uh, especially like verse 7, and therefore do not be uh, unwise, do not understand what you are, and do not be drunk in wine. And then it goes to verse 19, speaking to one another in hymns and psalms. It's talking about all the positive things that you need to do um, with your time. So to me, a very large waste of time would be having being negative, negative towards others, negative about yourself, which is also those things that you feel negative about yourself includes things that will cause you to be negative. You know, that it can be a uh or related, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. One leads to the other. Yeah. Yeah, that's the as you said, one of the worst ways to spend time is by dwelling on the negative. 
Uh, and I would find people like that. I said, usually what I tell them is don't allow them to bring you down to their level. And that's what we do when we get mad and we hold grudges and we think negatively. We're bringing ourselves down to their level rather than elevating them to ours. And not that we need to be egotistical and say that we're holier than thou or anything like that, but at least we're thinking positive about things and that's bound to perk you up. So that it's helpful to be possible. One of the hardest things, uh, at least in my mind, to learn why be strong and stand for what's right. I mean, that, that's first and foremost, that's what we have to do. But, but in a way, that you're not dragging everybody down. Right. You know, I mean, if they want to get dragged down because they just get mad, that's one thing. But, you know, but to do that and not be responsible for that, or in other words, to do your best to be at me while you're doing it, that's, that's, that's a hard thing to learn. Yes. Well, like we talk in ladies' Bible class, what the main focus of ladies' Bible class is to let your light shine. Um, if you spend more of your time letting your light shine, I think it kind of dampens the dark. You know? Sure. And you can even help others with that, which is another great thing of time management, is to spend your time helping other people. I learned a great lesson years ago when I was preaching in the Cincinnati area. We lived in Hamilton, Ohio. And I was on the radio program. You know, 54 years I've been on radio for 50 of <laughs> But uh, I was counting that up the other day in, in some form or another on radio stations throughout the Midwest. Anyway, one lady from Cincinnati called me one day during the program. And I invited people to call me. And she said, we're not as bad as you think we are. And I, I realized what I was saying was that I was preaching against sin and I was hitting at it pretty hard, which you need to do. But if you keep being negative about it, then people get so down on themselves that they think, well, if I'm really that bad, there's no hope for me going to heaven anywhere. And that's the impression I had left that woman. And so she taught me a lesson that she didn't realize because she wanted to pick at me for something else. Uh, but in her statement... Uh, that's one thing I've learned that I'm always trying to keep that in the back of my mind. Uh, when you preach against sin, and you have to preach against sin, and sometimes that requires some negative preaching. Uh, uh, to the other extreme, there are, there are preachers who preach nothing but what they call positive things. And everything's just hunky-dory and gin dandy and whatever cliche you want to use. Uh, and, so, and they never preach or teach anything against anything. And so... I learned that lesson, and I've always tried to, to have a balanced diet of both positive and negative. Because uh, you, you don't want to let people browbeat them or make them feel so bad about themselves that uh, they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, we had the paying up here in Proverbs 3, 27, 28. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, which is exactly what we were just talking about, when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will get it when you have it with you. Don't procrastinate. If you can take care of this situation now, if you have the product or whatever it is with you now on hand, then let's take care of it right now. Or in Romans 7, 13 and verse 7, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Whatever is within your means to do it, you do it. Make sure that you get it done now, as we said in this first point. Don't be lazy. Manage your time well and pay up what you owe. Uh, don't keep putting it off. And that's where, again, people get into a lot of financial trouble is they keep postponing their payments and they wind up, wind up paying so much in interest that they don't get anything paid on the principal. And on and on and on it goes. And all they do is pay off the, the interest on the credit card each month. And they get very little paid on the and that's one of the casualties of our society. And I understand there are circumstances that you may have to do that under certain situations. But by and large, if you can pay, get, get out from under the debt. And if it's within you to do the Lord's service, whatever you can do, then make sure you're acting and doing what you can.
Um, uh, three more points here very quickly. This is the last slide I had that we, uh, I, I just talk too much and uh, <laughs> have a tendency to do that sometimes. But uh, I mentioned this already to you about Numbers 30 and verse 2 about procrast procrastination of vows. We talked about this at the beginning. Uh, the verse says, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Then in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 and 5, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. So again, that's Ecclesiastes, the wisdom of Solomon in chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And Moses said in Deuteronomy 23, 21, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it, for the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. So if you make a promise that you're going to follow the Lord and worship Him in spirit and the truth, you better be sure that you keep that promise. God expects you to keep it. Whatever vow you make it to God. It, and how many times do we find our say, ourselves saying, at least in our minds and our hearts, if not audibly, we'll say, Oh Lord, if you can get me through this situation, I'll do thus and so. We think that way. And so we, you know, whatever the situation is, if, it's, if we're in dire straits and we know that God's the only one that's going to be able to help us out, we promise it. And you know, the one that comes to mind is Hannah in this. Lord, if you will give me a son. Well, I don't know if she was, I wasn't there, I don't know her motivation, but that word, little two word, letter word, if, has always bothered me. If you will do this for me, Lord, then I'll do this for you. Well, he did give her Samuel, of course. And it all turned out well, as far as that's concerned. But just, that's something that kind of, as we used to say, whittling on the Lord's end of the stick. We don't want to be caught doing that uh, because God is the, is the judge and we shouldn't be bargaining with Him, is what I'm saying. So uh, if you make a promise to God, then make sure that you follow through with it. Uh, concerning your giving, uh, make sure that you set aside a certain amount and if something comes up, you say, well, Lord, I, I, I intended, I promised you I'd give you $5 this week, but uh, I'm going to have to come back to two. Uh, we need to follow through. And it is, the Bible teaches in principle anyway that it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's another chimney corner scripture, but it is uh, actually stated in, in the principle form uh, that you can, somebody once told me, well, several people told me over here, you can't ever outgive the Lord. No matter how hard you try, you can't outgive the Lord. For whatever you give for His cause, He's going to pay you back with many more blessings. And it works that way. A few <coughs> reminders. James 4.17 Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's sin. If you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it, that's sinful. In Ecclesiastes 10, 10, 10, if the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. Sharpen the tools. Take time. Use your time wisely. You ever tried to cut down a tree with a bell axe? Man, that's hard. Because I was one of those kids that went out and cut down trees and never wanted to take the time to sharpen the axe. It took me about 10 times longer than my friends who sharpened their tools. And I just bound determined I had enough strength, I'm a real man. And, you know, don't kid yourself. When it needs to be done, make sure you make the proper preparations. And that's why I say, don't forget about these. Why are these reminders? We must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Uh, John 9, 4, and Paul said in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This fruit of the Spirit is all these things. Don't forget, besides all the negative things we mentioned this evening, that there is this positive sign which we also mentioned. But as is said here by Paul to the Galatian provinces, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and all these things. So these are the sharp tools that we have that can help us get through life. And finally, for some examples and, and 
Jane and I were discussing this this afternoon, and she said, what, what kind of examples did you have that you're going to use for this class? And I didn't want to tell her at the time, but I thought, I'm never going to get to those examples. And lo and behold, I was right. <laughs> so we'll probably have more discussion about this when we get on. But the examples that we're going to talk about in Luke 14, 17, and 18, when the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. In Proverbs 22, 13, the sluggard says, There is a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets. So it never goes outside because of danger. So there are a lot of people like that, especially in, in what we've experienced in the last year and a half, two years. People are scared to death. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be cautious, but get me wrong. I'm just saying that you can't let the lion take over your life. And so we're looking at the examples, and, and Jane had a whole bunch of these that I wish I had time to get into, but I've got 60 seconds left. And uh, you mentioned a couple of them. Jane, just off the top of your head. The obvious one that comes to mind is Pilate washing his hands of his responsibility. All right. Pilate washing his, hand, washing his hands of his responsibility. What is the Old Testament one with Gideon? Uh, Gideon's father. Uh, when they came to him, wanted him to punish Gideon for destroying the Baal altar. He said, well, let Baal do it because you're not going to touch this. Story about Gideon. There's one other that I remember uh, specifically you mentioned. I can't recall which it was. Anyway, we, I'm sorry, we didn't, I had more time. I, I, the one I was thinking about was Saul. Uh -huh. Whenever he would do something he really shouldn't have been doing and God was confronting him, he always, he was always coming up with you. Yeah. Well, our time is up. Uh, thank you for listening to me and uh, hopefully uh, in your comments that you made appreciate it. we'll start start next week and talk about lesson number 13 which is uh, so in tears reap in joy and that is a bible phrase and we'll uh, hopefully discuss that next week One closest to the light. One on your left. That's what it was doing. That's why I shut it off. Sorry about that. For our invitation tonight, there's a passage in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that I think, uh, I don't think we've abused it over the years, but something we have emphasized perhaps uh, to the detriment of something else in the passage. And that is that we, we emphasize so much because if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Jesus is Lord. And we emphasize that when people come forward and they want to be baptized into Christ, we uh, ask them to make that confession, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And upon that confession, then we baptize them. But there's a couple of things here. A couple of things here that I want to emphasize, and that's in the word heart. Um, and shalt believe. In other words, confess with your mouth. But And shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. This whole context, beginning back at verse 1, says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. 
For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. And so while we do want to emphasize that confession of Christ as your Savior, as your Lord and Master is important, uh, as I said, I think we've kind of minimized the fact that the heart is mentioned here. And if you're really going to become a Christian, you need to do it from the heart, from your mind, the Bible heart, that you need to have that consecration and dedication unto the Lord. For not knowing, at verse 3, not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to dis establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Their heart wasn't in it. They had a zeal, but not according to the knowledge of God. So unless you really put your heart into it when you obey the gospel, you may miss the point. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your heart, or excuse me, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching, he says. So we emphasize again, this is verses 9 and 10, uh, that we, part of the plan of salvation is to uh, hear God's word and believe it, repent of your sins, confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ. But then with your heart, show your wholehearted consecration and dedication to Him. Be converted unto the Lord by your heart. Not just what you feel, but what your mind, what your intellect tells you to do as based upon this written word of God. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation tonight, we bid you come. All together we stand. I say, to thee, the saints the cannot
who's held meetings here for us. Uh, so if you can get down there, there's two more nights of that, Thursday and Friday. Right there in Old Right, in Old No, it's it's in the Old before you get, you turn left into Old and then you go down a few blocks and turn left again. Yeah, well, when you when you get to the the flasher light that turns to go right to Springville, you go right to Springville. You can go until you come to Olytic, and then it's that next light that you, and turn left. Yeah, and it's at seven o'clock. I'm sure Don would be glad to see you next week. Today, uh, tomorrow night and Friday. It's been going on this week. Okay, anything else we need to mention? Don't forget the radio program from 8.30 to 9 and uh, Bible classes back here at 9.45, services at 10.30 and 6. Uh, nothing else to be announced. Glenn, would you dismiss us, please? Father, we call us to give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for everything he gives us. We thank you now for the night that we've had learning something of your word. Ask you to pray that all have been pleasing in your sight. Ask you to be with the ones that have been mentioned as sick. They might be made well and be able to come back and be with us again. The one that had doctor's appointments, it all might go well with that. Thank you for every blessing of life. Know that all good things come to you. Give us our sins and finally save us. Be blessed. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.